Movies occupy a substantial footprint in our cultural and economic landscape. They can give us vivid experiences that we may remember better than most of our real lives. These facts mean that film is an important phenomenon to be explained and also a treasure trove of knowledge about how the mind and brain function. Just to remind you of the thing we're going to be talking about, I want to show you uh, 16 seconds of an aerial chase scene in uh, last year's film, uh, Black Panther, directed by Ryan Coogler. Critical weapons failure. Okay, we're going to leave Martin Freeman hanging virtually in the air there. Um, there's a lot that we could uh, talk about, but the question that I want to ask is, how many edits were there? Um, that is, how many times did the camera's viewpoint change suddenly? I've listed four options. I'd like you to think uh, about which would be your best guess and then uh, clap when I call the option that you chose. So how many perceived zero edits, a continuous run of the camera? Okay, one to three. Okay, four to six. Okay, seven or more. Okay, not bad. So there were eight edits in that sequence, a rate of about one every two seconds, and a lot of you were on target. But those of you who chose something other than the first option, don't feel bad. That's, the, that's a very typical response. In fact, it's so common that it has a name, edit blindness, and it's something of a paradox for vision science. Edits are huge visual disruptions. Every point in that image changes discontinuously from one moment to the other. Over the 400 million years that our visual systems were evolving, we never experienced that until film was invented about 125 years ago. Yet in commercial cinema, most edits go unnoticed, and many are undetected even when people are deliberately attending to find them. So um, what could be going on? One way that you can appreciate how strange this is is um, to put people in uh, an MRI scanner, have them watch movies, time lock brain activity to those points at which uh, there are edits. So here I'm showing you such activity projected on the cortical surface of the left hemisphere. Um, and what you can see, there's the medial surface, you saw the lateral surface, is um, particularly um, particularly right here uh, in uh, the medial surfaces, primary visual cortex, and we see large, robust activations. In fact, these are about the largest activations that we see in naturalistic comprehension. So how can edits be so invisible? Everything in the image is changing. The whole back of your brain is lighting up. What's going on? We hypothesize that Film is leveraging the mechanisms that we evolved to deal with vision in the natural world. So in the, it is the case that in the real world, objects are pretty stable. However, um, it turns out that our visual input is actually quite jumpy and interrupted for three main reasons. The first is that we make psychotic eye movements, jumpy eye movements two to three times a second, and each time your eyes uh, move, you're functionally blind for about uh, 80 milliseconds. We blink every couple seconds, two to three seconds, and those take about 200 to 300 milliseconds. Somebody's calculated that between the two of those, we're functionally blind a third of our waking lives, which I find kind of wonderful. Um, and even if your eyes are open and they're pointed at, right at something, a truck might drive in front of it. It might be occluded. And so our brains have evolved to deal with those problems. And as most in this room will know, the solution has involved a set of hierarchically organized visual areas depicted here. So visual information lands in the brain first in primary visual cortex and then project, projects forward through a series of uh, hierarchically organized areas generating representations that become increasingly elaborated, abstracted, and involve larger receptive fields. But for each of those forward projections, there's usually a back projection, a top-down projection, that is at least as strong and most of the time stronger than the forward projection. So one possibility 
is that higher level vision bridges across these uh, discontinuities in the input through top-down processing that constructs features across the disparate views to construct a coherent event model, a coherent model of what's happening now. Um, if so, then the brain areas implementing these bridging mechanisms ought to have a couple particular properties. So uh, they ought to increase at those edits, at those discontinuities that happen within an event when you need to connect across dis disparate views. But when one event ends and another begins, for example, if someone walks from one room into another or the action cuts from one time to another, it would be maladaptive to bridge across those. So at those points, um, you might expect that these areas would be less active. So we went looking for areas that showed this response profile. I'm gonna show them uh, again projected on the uh, left cortical hemisphere. So now in red, in addition to the activity that you saw before in orange, you can see a collection of higher level visual areas that form almost a ring around the low level visual areas um, that show this pattern of bridging across visual discontinuity. So what this suggests to us is that film editing is leveraging the neural mechanisms for coping with discontinuities due to eye movements, blinks, and occlusion that we evolved over a long period. Commercial editing practices have evolved over a much shorter time period to give us a sequence of views that cater to our evolved visual routines. And uh, filmmakers can use these if they adhere to these uh, capacities, then the editing is smooth and continuous and relatively invisible. Of course, you can work against them to produce the opposite kind of effect, as in, say, suspense films. Now, this proposal says that vision's doing a bunch of surgery on the input in order to construct a coherent event model. A reasonable question at this point is, well, uh, what's an event model? Um, and almost 20 years ago, Barbara Tversky and I proposed that one ubiquitous component of ongoing com comprehension is the construction of a series of representation of events that are bounded in space and have beginnings and endings. And just to give you more of a qualitative sense of what I mean by an event in this context, I'm gonna um, ask you to perform a task that we and others often use in the lab. This is a simple perceptual task in which I want you to clap whenever in your judgment one meaningful unit of activity ends and another begins. I'm gonna show you a little clip in a second. We tell our participants that there's no right or wrong answer. I'm simply interested in your judgments. And so that we can gather data more quickly, right now I'm gonna ask you to mark the smallest units that you find natural and meaningful. So. Okay, we can stop there. So hopefully you notice that with approximately zero trials of practice, um, most of the people in this room were able to perform this task. I gave you almost no instruction, you had no practice, but it's very natural and people show very strong intersubjective agreement about where the event boundaries are. Um, now the sequence that I just showed you has no edits. You perceived event structure in virtue of the structure of the activity. But one important thing that we've learned is that film editing can structure events by controlling the timing of changes in the unfolding action. Um, and one reason that this is important is that the structure of those events during perception determines the organization of our subsequent memory. So um, to illustrate this, I'm gonna show you a trial of a study that Kenna Swallow conducted when she was in the lab. And uh, in this experiment, people watched excerpts from Cinema of the World. This is from a Jacques Tati movie from the 60s about Paris after the war. And it's got lots of people and objects coming and going. There's dialogue, but you don't need to understand the dialogue to follow the action. And the editing here is going to give you what for most of our viewers was judged to be a major event boundary when he walks into that building. And perhaps because that is experienced as an event boundary, you might have trouble recognizing which of these objects was on the screen until exactly five seconds before I cut the tape. So uh, let's, again, let's clap. How many uh, would vote for the cat? How many would vote for the chair? Okay, um, that's about how we usually do it. So like, when I do this for audience, usually about a third of the people say the cat, a third of the people say the chair, and a third of the people are too shy to respond. Um, it's the chair, and in these experiments, we stop the movie and restart it so that the participants can see what the correct answer was. So the chair was 
on the screen in the middle of your visual field until five seconds before we removed it. The design is a quasi-experimental design in which we're manipulating two features. Um, first of all, half of the objects, um, while they're encoded, there's an event boundary indicated by these uh, red lines uh, while the object is on the screen. So we pre-tested all these with lots of people telling us where the event boundaries are. And so there's an event boundary and then some time goes by and then we test memory exactly five seconds after it goes off the screen. So in these two cases, there's a boundary that happened while the object was on the screen. And we hypothesize that at those points, people are updating their event models and they're doing some extra processing that might bind together features of that uh, object with the context to facilitate uh, a more durable form of memory. In the other two cases, there was no event boundary while the object was on the screen. Half of the time, when we test the object, it's still the same current event. So even if you didn't bind the features together in a durable fashion, you might be holding on to the relevant information in your current event model. So that's this case and this case. And then our case of the chair here was the worst case scenario, where it wasn't encoded during an event boundary and another boundary is occurred before we test. If we look at memory performance, what you see is um, that as l for those objects that were in encoded during an event boundary, performance is consistently good. If there wasn't an event boundary while it was encoded, performance is still good as long as you're still within the same event, but when you cross that into the new event, uh, performance uh, uh, approaches the floor. Now, this case here, where you've updated your event model, uh, but you're still able to respond to accurately to the item, those are particularly interesting. And we hypothesized uh, that objects like that might be able to hang in because um, the updating process would facilitate binding by the medial temporal memory, sorry, the medial temporal lobe memory system. This is a system that's usually thought of as subserving long-term memory, but there's increasing evidence that it's critical for binding together features so that we can use them online as well. So this is a coronal slice through the brain illustrating the hippocampus and parahippocampal gyri. And we time-locked activity uh, in, I'm gonna show you data from the hippocampus, time-locked to the attempt to retrieve. And what you see is it's just this case where a new event has begun but performance is still good that selectively activates both the left and right hippocampus. And what this suggests to us is that these events in experience are gestalts or units in comprehension. And those units um, determine uh, what we subsequently remember. Um, if we look at longer delays, there's now abundant evidence that uh, from from my lab and others, uh, that the contents and the things that get bound together um, as a result of this event updating form the units of subsequent long-term memory. And this suggests that maybe we could use techniques like film editing to facilitate and guide uh, memory encoding to facilitate better subsequent memory. We've been trying a couple tacks to get at this. Uh, this is a paradigm that was developed by Dave Gold when he was a postdoc in the lab. So this is that kitchen sequence again. And what we do here is at a point that our viewers told us was an event boundary, we ring a bell, we slow it down, we pause, we point an arrow at the object she's interacting with. We're doing all these interventions to get people to update their event models at the, that point. And the, the idea was that facilitating, pushing this updating might, um, boost subsequent memory. If we look at memory for those points that are cued with that editing manipulation, what we see is that indeed uh, information from those uh, event boundary points is better remembered if they're cued. But it's not just that cueing any moment in the movie boosts memory for that moment. If we cue the middles of the events, it's not effective. So you've got to fit the editing manipulation to the natural structure of the ongoing activity. Now, we should not lose track of the fact that the brain itself is a, a pretty impressive film editor, right? So in the, in the kitchen sequence, there were no edits at all, but we perceived robust uh, event segmentation. Um, when Shaney Flores is in, was in the lab, we looked to see whether we could tune up the mechanisms of that ongoing self-editing of experience by just asking people to attend to it. And the way we did it was by having them do the task that I just had you do, the clapping task. So they did it by pushing buttons. And we asked people either to mark um, event boundaries 
or to just simply watch and try and remember as much as possible, or to control for the perceptual and motor demands of uh, the event uh, boundary, se the segmentation task, we sometimes had people just push a button every 10 seconds. And what you can see is that um, performing the segmentation task, this is at a one week delay, it holds out to a month, um, it leads to a significantly better memory. Last question I want to entertain is why we have event memory at all. If you look at what we do in uh, the psychology of memory, you tend to think that the reason that people have event memory uh, and event memory systems is to sit in a chair in my lab and deliberately search for information about word lists. And that's probably not the evolutionary pressure that drove to the uh, emergence of these systems. Um, a much better case, I think, can be made that the reason that we have event memories is to auto-associatively retrieve relevant information from recent experiences and use that to predictively guide our comprehension of new experiences to facilitate better action. Here's an extreme version of that. So this is a little excerpt from the Bill Murray film um, Groundhog Day. At this point, he's lived the same day in his life about 50 times. And so Ten, he's able to perfectly predict nine, the sequence of events eight, that's gonna unfold, including their timing bar, of like the car going by. Six, and then the people five, getting distracted in front of quarter, the armored car, allowing three, him to slide two, in and lift uh, a bag of money from the armored car. So that's why we have event memory to be able to steal. Um, in, I mean, in real life, we haven't lived things uh, 500 times, but if you experienced something yesterday and you come into a similar looking situation today, chances are things are gonna unfold in a similar fashion. To get at this in the lab, we've developed this paradigm where we bring people in and we show them uh, a movie that depicts a day in the life uh, of our actor. And so this is from about two thirds of the way through. The movie usually takes about half an hour. She's coming home, she gets out of her car, um, and she goes into the house. So they watch this movie, and then after either a short delay or maybe a week later, we tell them, that was day one, we want you to now watch another movie uh, depicting another day in this actor's life, and this person is an academic, so their life is pretty repetitive, one day is more or less like the last. So you're gonna see a lot of the same um, activities, but you will see her do some things that she didn't do on the first day. Uh, but so here again, about two thirds of the way through, she comes home, she gets out of the car, she goes in the house. Now some of you will have just noticed that the second time when she went into the house, she did it differently. So on the first day she opened the, by unlocking the deadbolt, and on the second day um, she unlocked the doorknob. And um, our idea, uh, and this is a, a, a theory that Chris Walheim and I proposed in a recent uh, JP General article is that during the comprehension of day two, memory for day one is going to auto associatively retrieve, uh, drive, you're going to auto associatively retrieve that. It's going to drive predictions about how things will go. And most, the reason that this happens is because most of the time this is adaptive. When things change, it can lead to a prediction error, which is disruptive in the short term. But if things go well, what it can cause is the updating of your event model, incorporating information about the retrieved information, the predictions, and the prediction error, which can lead to a really robust uh, representation that includes what happened on day two, what happened on day one, the relationship between them. So um, here's data from a representative experiment. If we start with just the rate of being able to recall, if we ask people what happened when she got out of the car, um, and they only saw that on day two, and we asked them about day two, and then we compare what happens uh, if they also saw the same thing on day one. This is a revelatory discovery that uh, repetition increases memory. The interesting case is we consider the change uh, condition. So 50 years of interference theory tells us what ought to happen. If I pair getting out of the car with opening the deadbolt on day one and pair it with opening the um, doorknob on day two, that should produce proactive interference. And instead, what we typically observe, at least for healthy young adults, is proactive facilitation. And it turns out that the, whether you observe facilitation or interference depends totally on whether you 
can recognize after the fact that this was an item that changed. So here, the ball, size of the balls is telling you the proportion. So most of the time, these participants are able to tell us, oh yeah, that was one of the items that changed. And when they can do that, they're golden. They can tell us what happened on the second day and what happened on the first day and the relationship between them. But on the other hand, when they can't, uh, they have very poor recall, and in fact, what they usually do is intrude the ending from day one. We can look online at these prediction mechanisms by tracking their eyes uh, while they're watching day two, and what you find is that this ability to recollect the change is strongly associated with having made an erroneous predictive glance to, in this case, the deadbolt when her hand is actually going to go to the doorknob. So um, what this suggests to us is the involuntary associative retrieval of event memories is guiding comprehension. Now filmmakers can use this to manipulate our expectations, right? So if they give us some cue that causes us to retrieve something that happened in the first act, then that's going to guide our expectations. They can then play to those expectations, producing a sense of nostalgia or recurrence, or play against them. Uh, leading to a sense of suspense or surprise. And in real life, this leads to updating, which can produce long-term memory encoding. So just to conclude, film editing leverages neural mechanisms that we evolved for coping with visual discontinuities in the real world. Editing can produce event boundaries where uh, working memory representations are updated. And event boundaries then determine the structure of long-term memory, which in turn feeds back determining how we perceive subsequent experiences. Um, I just want to thank you and, uh, and thank Barbara so much and um, acknowledge uh, the contributions of my laboratory. This is highly collaborative work, and I want to thank the people who I worked with on this in and out of the lab. <laughs>